This is a mechanism of disease map for malaria. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, the life cycle, and the manifestations of malaria. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to these concepts that you see in the top right, and I'll be discussing each of these boxes one by one as we repopulate this flowchart. So let's get started. The etiology of malaria revolves around this parasite, parasite in the plasmodium genus. Now there are several species within plasmodium, and we'll talk about the differences between those here. Plasmodium falciparum is the classic cause of malaria. It causes virulent disease compared to the others, and also severe disease compared to the others. It's most commonly found in Africa. In comparison, Plasmodium vivax causes milder disease. It's typically found outside of Africa, such as in Southeast Asia. Plasmodium ovale and P. malariae are also less common, less uh, severe diseases, more milder diseases. And lastly, this is the most recent that we've discovered, Plasmodium nolesi is found in Southeast Asia. It causes severe malaria, and in some cases it is thought to be zoonotic. These parasites alone are not enough to cause malaria. They also need to be transmitted and inserted into humans. And this happens with a bite from a mosquito, specifically the female Anopheles mosquito. So when you have a bite from a mosquito that's containing one of these parasites, one of the plasmodium parasites, the mosquito can inject plasmodium sporozoites into the humans. Now sporozoite is just a, one of the forms of plasmodium and we'll be talking about the other forms as we progress through the life cycle of uh, the plasmodium genus. Before we do that, let's talk about more of the etiology of these mosquitoes. In order to get malaria, we've already established that you need mosquitoes, and um, it, it's, these mosquitoes aren't found everywhere. You can find mosquitoes in many parts of the world, but malaria isn't found everywhere. So um, you really only get malaria when you live in or travel to endemic regions, places where malaria already exists and thrives. These regions are typically tropical areas and most commonly places like Africa, Asia, Central and South America. So um, although you might find mosquitoes in some parts of Europe and the United States, malaria is rare in those countries. And when it does come to those countries, it's usually from people who have traveled to endemic regions. Now, we know that you need a mosquito to transmit malaria. So one of the most effective forms of malaria prophylaxis is by preventing the bites from the mosquitoes. So mosquito nets, protective clothing such as pants and long sleeve shirts that cover all of your exposed skin, and mosquito repellent, specifically using the chemical DEET. These are effective forms of malaria prophylaxis. There's also chemoprophylaxis for malaria, and that has varying levels of efficacy. I'm not getting into it on this slide and in this video, um, but those might be worth looking into as well. Um, but I believe these are more effective, more definitive treatments for preventing a bite from a mosquito. Now that you've been bitten by a mosquito uh, that contains the plasmodium uh, parasite, then you have an injection of the plasmodium sporozoite into humans, we can begin the asexual development site of the plasmodia life cycle. So the sporozoites travel through the bloodstream to the liver of the human. And as I mentioned, this is the asexual development that happens in humans. Once they get to the liver, they then enter the hepatocytes, that's the liver cells, and they multiply asexually forming schizons containing thousands of merozoites. So this is just the next form of plasmodium in its life cycle. The merozoites then enter red blood cells. So you've gone from the bloodstream to the liver and now in the red blood cells. And one of two things can happen here. The merozoites can mature into the next stage of the life cycle called trophozoites. It's the feeding stage. And there they form red blood cell schizons and replicate. You can have thousands that uh, appear from a merozoite. This is a very proliferative asexual development stage. This is where you get most of your symptoms of malaria, and we'll see many things branch off of this um, box right here. Alternatively, in the merozoites in the red blood cells, they can differentiate into gametocytes, and this is what brings us back to the sexual development phase. So when these gametocytes get ingested by the same mosquito, the female Anopheles mosquito, um, they then begin the sexual development stage, and that happens in the mosquito itself. So when the mosquito eats the plasmodium gametocytes, the gametocytes then mature into sporozoites in the mosquito's intestines, and those sporozoites then migrate to the mosquito's salivary glands, 
where it can be injected again into another human, thus completing the life cycle and completing um, this kind of spread of malaria. So notice that there are two phases to this life cycle for malaria. You have sexual development within the mosquito and you have asexual development within humans. And the bite from the female Anopheles mosquito is integral for the transfer between these two parts that complete the life cycle. So um, before we move on into the manifestations, there are a couple other things that modify this pathway here, the asexual development in humans. First is this Duffy antigen. This is an antigen that's on red blood cells, and the merozoites use it to enter the red blood cells. So there are some genotypic changes um, that people have altered Duffy antigens or no Duffy antigen. These people would be resistant somewhat to malaria. So if the merozoites cannot enter the red blood cell because there is an altered Duffy antigen or no antigen, these people will have some built-in innate resistance to malaria. Similarly, if you're a carrier of the sickle cell mutation, it'll prevent this uh, merozoite maturing into trophozoites in the red blood cells and prevent replication in the red blood cells. So having a uh, single, uh, having, having part of the single cell sickle cell mutation can also help prevent malaria. And it's thought that this is why sickle cell disease happens in African American people. All right, next let's talk about the manifestations of malaria. These tend to occur 7 to 30 days after the person has been bit by a mosquito. So if somebody comes back from a trip um, and they were in, say, South America for a day and they have symptoms three days after, you'll know it's not malaria. This incubation period is required for malaria to spread um, throughout the body and for the patient to start having symptoms, 7 to 30 days typically, so a few weeks. So these are some general viral symptoms. First, malaria is... Um, typically causes a very high fever and it spikes at regular intervals. We used to be able to associate some of these um, different species of plasmodium to different spiking intervals. So for instance, if your fever would spike every two days or every three days, it might help you differentiate which plasmodium species you're actually infected with. We don't really do that anymore. Um, that data isn't really um, very robust. So um, we say malaria patients have high fever and it might spike at regular intervals, it might not. They'll have other viral symptoms like uh, muscle pains, joint pains, diaphoresis is listed here, headaches, um, chills, and night sweats as well. You can also get a number of GI symptoms from malaria, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is listed here as well, um, abdominal pain, hepatosplenomegaly that can manifest on the liver function tests um, as the liver is affected by the parasite, jaundice as well. Malaria also affects your blood in a couple of ways. It can cause a thrombocytopenia, so you could have a low platelet count on your CBC, and this can also lead to bleeding if your thrombocytes um, get too low. It can cause destruction of red blood cells, which can lead to a hemolytic anemia. This can present in the clinic as weakness, paleness, dizziness. It can also contribute to this jaundice that you have, and of course, that can appear on labs as well decreased hemoglobin, low haptoglobin. You can have a high LDH, a high indirect bilirubin. That high indi indirect bilirubin is what you're seeing when you see somebody with a jaundice. And you can have high reticulocytes as well as the body tries to replenish its normal levels of red blood cells. In more severe cases of malaria, you can have central nervous system findings such as hallucinations, confusion, impaired consciousness, and in very severe cases, you can have seizures and coma as well. Now the diagnosis of malaria, malaria is largely clinical and oftentimes based on a travel history. If somebody has just been to a uh, part of Colombia that has the mosquitoes or a part of Southeast Asia that has the mosquitoes or Sub-Saharan Africa that is known to have uh, malaria, then you might expect it to be malaria if they present with these symptoms. In the clinic, you can do a rapid diagnostic test for a, material, uh, for, for a malarial antigen, and there are more specific tests that come from a thin blood smear microscopy. Some of the findings are listed here. The findings really depend on where in the asexual development the parasite is. This has been a mechanism of disease map for malaria. I hope this was helpful and um, fairly comprehensive for the manifestations and the findings in somebody that has malaria. Thank you for listening.